Good evening, church. Uh, what a privilege it is again to have God's word, his living word opened up uh, and to have a look at it once more. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to grab your Bible or your phone. Uh, can you please turn to Isaiah chapter 50? Isaiah chapter 50 and have that kept open. Now, we're back in Isaiah. We were there last week, but I left a section that I wanted to deal with completely separately and give an entire sermon to. Now, just recapping what this chapter is all about, Isaiah Isaiah mentions that Israel is exiled. They are cut off from God. They have been taken out of their land. They have sinned and insulted God, and he's handed them over to their enemies But verses 4 to 9, there's this section in there where God uh, reintroduces this other figure, this servant of the Lord he's called. Now he's a mysterious figure. He is opposite to everything that Israel is. And he really is everything that they should have been. And he's coming one day and he'll be the living portrait of obedience and righteousness. Verses 10 and 11, God places this devastated Israel in the valley of decision. And God has promised of promised them restoration, but now he puts them in the place of decision. How will they respond to him? So tonight I want us to look at verses 10 to 11. There will be just two verses, two groups of people and two responses to the Lord. So let's read Isaiah 50. This is what the Lord says, Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins you were sold. Because of your transgressions your mother was sent away. When I came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Was my arm too short to ransom you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? By a mere rebuke I dry up the sea. I turn rivers into a desert, their fish rot for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the sky with darkness and make sackcloth its covering. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me. My cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. And where we'll be focusing tonight. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. But now all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go, walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you and we acknowledge how much we need you. We need your help. The preacher is weak and our hearts are weak to receive your word. We are dull, but your word is alive. We are powerless, but you send forth the Holy Spirit that changes lives. God, open up your word to us. Cause us to see wondrous things. Magnify your name in all of this. We have So many needs in our life, so many needs, but above all of them, magnify your name. And I pray that you may turn our eyes to Jesus Christ tonight. Turn our eyes upon him. We ask for your help and may we leave forever changed for his name's sake. Amen. Well, where we are now in verse 10, God acknowledges Israel as sitting in darkness there's a, they're in trial, they're facing crisis, they're in a place of sorrow. But first God wants to call out to see who of Israel are really his. Now, all of them are Israelites, they're all Jews, but who of them really belong to him? Who are the true Jews inwardly? 
verse 10, he says, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? So here's the first group of people that we see tonight. Any who fear Yahweh and obey the word of his servant. So this is what God says are the distinguishing marks of those who are truly his people. The first thing is they fear the Lord. And fearing the Lord is a good thing. In Exodus 20, after the Ten Commandments are given and God has terrified them with his presence on the mount, Moses says this to them, God did this so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. What what does fearing God look like? Well, in Isaiah 66 verse 2, God says, To this one I will esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit, him who trembles at my word. Psalm 119, 120 puts it a different way. It says, I tremble in fear of your judgments. See, this is exactly what Israel had been lacking. They did not heed his warnings. They did not fear his threatenings. They did not listen to the cautions of judgment that the prophet spoke over and over again. This is where Israel lacked. And so God now addresses the few faithful who are the ones that fear him, who do not treat him contemptuously. And the second characteristics of those who belong to the Lord, the few who are faithful, they also obey the word of his servant. See, fearing God and obeying, obeying the servant, these are two sides uh, of the same coin. They always go hand in hand. You won't find someone who truly in a holy sense fears the Lord and yet doesn't obey him. It, It just doesn't work like that. But who is this obedience directed to? Who do the people obey? Well, he says here, obey the word of his servant. Verses 4 to 9, who, who did the servant of the Lord refer to? It refers to Jesus. It refers to the Messiah. So, so fearing God is obedient submission to the word of Jesus. In Luke chapter 9, verse 35, God speaks from heaven and he says, This is the Son whom I love, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. See, God's authority is invested in this servant, his own son. So if you don't obey the son, you don't fear God and you disobey God. In verses 4 to 9, the servant of the Lord is the obedient servant. And we see verses in verse 6, he's obedient even unto death. Now, the point of bringing him up here is this servant, he's not just to be admired, to look at and go, wow, isn't he amazing? He's not even just to be believed in, even though that is the foundation on which we're built. We must believe in the servant of the Lord. But he's not just to be admired and believed in. That's not where it stops because God says, who are they that obey the word of his servant? Those who obey the son. He is the faithful servant. He is the greatest disciple God ever had. Now we are to imitate him, to keep our eyes on him and imitate. See, in Matthew 24, Jesus speaks of his second coming and he refers to his people as servants. He was the servant and he refers to his people as servants. And then he goes on to say in the parable, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master will find ready when he returns? See, there is, a, there is an obedience, there is an imitation of, of our servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the first group that God is addressing. Those who are marked by a fear of him and obedience to his servant, the Lord Jesus. Now, what is his word to, the, to this group, to those who are faithful to him? What's his word to them? Look at the second half of verse 10. Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light... Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Did you, did you notice what the faithful few are experiencing? What are they going through? It says they are walking in darkness and they have no light. Literally, the Hebrew there is no light at all, not even a flicker, not even a ray. 
What a difference this was for Israel. God had previously led them through the wilderness at nighttime by a pillar of fire. And now they don't even have a flicker of light. They sit in darkness. What, what is this darkness that they're in? Well, for Israel to be blessed, to experience blessing was for the Lord to turn his countenance towards them, to make his face shine upon them. Then what is it then to be in darkness? It's to not have that, to not have his face shining upon them. They were nowhere near the temple. They were nowhere near God. They were separated from God. They were in the hands of their enemies. And all they experienced was woe and sorrow. But keep in mind, who, who, who is the group that God is addressing here? This is still group one. This is those who fear Yahweh, those who obey his servant. And, and this is why I'm emphasizing this is because it's so important for us to, to, to get this. Because we see over and over in the Bible that those who are faithful are still made to sit in darkness for seasons of life. Those who are devoted to the Lord will at times have to grope in darkness. They will receive no answers from Him. They are made to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. There are so many examples of this in the Bible of those who are faithful. Let me give you a few. You know Joseph. He's the victim of jealousy and anger and his brothers sell him into slavery. Even once he gets out of that and works his way out of that, through God's favor, he resists sexual temptation and sexual immorality. And what does he cost him? He's the victim of lies and he's thrown into a dark prison. And he is left to sit there for two years. Two years for being faithful. He has to stay in prison. What about David? From at just the, the, at the tender age of a boy, God promises him the crown. He will be king. But what was the journey to the crown like? Well, you just read 1 and 2 Samuel. He spent virtually every day of his life on the run for his very life from murderous Saul. Saul was after him. Saul was seeking to kill him. So you read about David. He's running through the wilderness. He's running down valleys. He's having to hide in cold and dark caves. He's sitting in the darkness. And, and he keeps hearing reports that the trail behind him is, is Saul killing people trying to get to David. And so when you read the Psalms, much of the weeping in the Psalms is David sitting in darkness. Psalm 27, hide not your face from me, O God. Make your face shine upon me, he's saying. And also in Psalm 10, why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Where are you? You're nowhere to be found. How about the Apostle Paul? Oh, he's famous. He's famous as the, as the Apostle who, when he was in prison, said, Rejoice, and again I say, rejoice in the Lord. He's famous for that. He's famous for, uh, for being able to say he's learned contentment in every situation, nakedness or clothing, poverty or riches, prison or freedom. But, but this same Paul, don't misunderstand him. He still experienced great darkness at times. Listen to him in 2 Corinthians 1 verses 8 to 9. He says this, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. Wow. He despaired of life, despaired of living. See, God's people, the faithful, they will experience the dreaded darkness. Now, what does this dreaded darkness look like for the Christian, the faithful Christian? What, this, what might this experience look like? Well, this might look like an experience of, of distance from God. And it's not because of, of uh, falling into defiant sin. It's got nothing to do with that. It just happens. And also it could refer to a lacking an assurance of heaven. That, that, and it's not because of willful sin, but the Spirit is not bearing witness and not testifying with our spirit that we're children of God for a season. And it leads to melancholy of soul and depression of soul. 
Also, it could be great periods of sorrow, trial after trial, and great grief that comes in our life, and there's no comfort in it. We get no comfort from Him. It could also be this darkness could be ignorance, and, and, and not in the negative sense on our part, but that God is keeping us in the dark about His workings in our life. Why is He allowing such difficulties? Why is He allowing these bodily ailments, these broken relationships, these opposition and persecution and, and suffering that I'm facing? And we plead and plead and He doesn't answer. And all that He's bringing into our life, it's a mystery. He keeps it all veiled and He doesn't show us what He's doing. There's no answers to the pleading, just just darkness. What is God's counsel to the faithful when they find themselves in this when they find themselves in this darkness? What is it? Look at verse ten B again. Let him who walks in the dark who has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. This is a call in the darkness to trust in the name of the Lord. In the dark, trust. What, what is this? When you don't see, trust. It's simply a call to walk by faith, not by sight, because you're not seeing anything. All you've got to do is believe. In darkness, trust in the name of the Lord, he says. What, what's the name of the Lord? Well, the name of the Lord is, refers to everything that he has revealed about himself, who he is and what he's like. His name sums up all of that. So to trust in the name of the Lord is to trust that he is the ever-living God. Trust that he is ever present. Trust that he is ever faithful. Trust that he's the only wise God. So he brings these trials in his wisdom. Trust that he's the covenant keeper. Trust that he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Trusting in the name of the Lord. To trust in darkness. See, this is an exhortation from God to move beyond a feelings-based faith. We all fall into that. To fall into a feelings-based faith. And often the darkness grips us so tightly because we are waiting for feelings from God to be felt within us. But this instruction from God is to trust even when you don't feel anything. Even when you don't sense anything from God. Trust. That's to trust in the darkness. In the name of the Lord, he's saying that is enough. It is enough for you in those seasons. Now think about it. You might find yourself, is anxiety closing in upon you? Well, Isaiah says he is the prince of peace. Do you have anguish and sorrow that doesn't seem to subside? Paul says that he is the God of all comfort. Is everything ahead of you as you look into the future? Is it just darkness with nothing clear? James says he is the father of lights. Do you feel in your life that through the darkness you're prone to wander from God and not stay close? Peter says he is the shepherd and overseer of your souls. When you're in the darkness, do you feel like you continually keep tripping up into sin? The author of Hebrews says he who is able to keep you from stumbling. Look at all Look at all who who God is. Jude says he's able to keep you from stumbling. And the author of Hebrews says if our faith is even smaller than a mustard seed. The author of Hebrews says he is the author and perfecter of faith. There's so much hope here for us. Look at all that God is. It's in his name. Now what have I just done here? I have not created light for you. I have not done that. All I've simply done is quoted Scripture. Just just quote just quote scripture. How do you trust in his name? How do you cultivate that trust in his name? You must be in his word. You must have it coming in. You must let it soak in. You must behold him who is eternal on the very pages on your lap. He's there. And see, when you know him like this, you know him, you know what he's like, you don't need feelings to have hope in the darkness. You don't have to feel anything. You really don't. Now, feelings are wonderful, and God gives great moments of that where you're sensing and you're seeing, and praise God when those things come. But your hope is not dependent on feelings. Rather, your hope is dependent on his name. 
in all that he is. This is what God's showing us. So in the darkness, he says, trust in the name of the Lord. And in that, in that verse 10 there, he also says, and rely on his God. This is to lean upon him, be supported by him. What God is telling Israel, he's telling us, put no confidence in yourself. Lean on him. Peter says, cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. This is a call to lean on him. Lean hard on him. He can take it. His shoulders are big enough. He can take it. Now, leaning and relying on him, it sounds so nice, but, but what does that look like practically? Well, relying on him is also to really rely on the sustenance that he gives. Now, that sounds nice, but what, what does that mean practically? It is relying and feeding upon the provisions that he has given us. In the darkness, we must rely upon what he gives to us and we can trust in him and rely on him by doing what? By immersing ourselves in his word. We've already said that. Digging into his word, study and reflection. But also in, 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 uh, simultaneously with that, also singing hymns, psalms and spiritual songs, getting the word of God coming in through song. This is what Paul and Silas did in the midnight hour in prison. Sitting in darkness, literally, singing hymns, the word of God coming in. Listening to preaching. This is another thing that God has given us to sustain us. How often does God use preaching to give light to weary pilgrims? How often? Preaching is often, God uses it like windows in the house of a soul. They, they bring light in. They fun preaching functions as a window for light to come into the soul. Give yourself to listening to preaching and prayer. This is another thing that he's given us for the darkness so that we can rely on him. Prayer, not just intercession, not just petition and requests and all of these things. No, no, simple communion with him. Now, he may not be felt. He may not be felt in this season of darkness, but his throne is never closed. He has no office hours. Isn't that wonderful? Just this past week, the other night, I found myself really troubled by something. And it was really, really late, very late. Everyone was asleep. And as the world outside had winded down and it was the dark, late hour, isn't it wonderful that I could speak and retreat and talk to my Heavenly Father? How, how, how excellent, what, what a privilege this is to have in the darkness, communion with Him. And also he's given us, what to sustain us in the darkness, he's given us fellowship. How often does God use other believers as messengers of light for our lives in times of difficulty? One of the great examples is David when he's so terrified of Saul and he's almost at breaking point. Jonathan comes up to him and the text says that Jonathan helped him to find strength in the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Have others pray for you. You're praying, have them pray for you in this season of darkness. These, equal, these really are uh, God's provisions to keep us relying upon him. And, and really, as the Israelites had to gather manna daily, so we need to sort after and make use of these things daily in order to profit. In the immediate context, though, how, how do we specifically trust in the name of the Lord and rely on God? Well, what's God showing to Israel? Well, who stands out? Who's the key figure of this passage? The servant of the Lord, verses 4 to 9. He points Israel to the servant of the Lord. Yes, Joseph, he experienced darkness. Yes, David experienced darkness. Paul experienced darkness. But Isaiah prophesies of one who will experience darkness, darkness like no other. And yet through it all, he relies upon God. This is the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is where we find strength to rely on God the most. He is a suffering servant. Remember in verse 6, he said, I gave myself in obedience to God, my face to be, my beard to be ripped out of my face, my back to be torn apart. They spat on me. They mocked me. I endured through all of it in obedience. 
Did he not experience darkness? How dark, how dark was Gethsemane, that midnight garden as he was in there. What trauma he felt in soul, body and mind in that garden. So much so, the darkness was so strong, it said he began to sweat drops of blood onto the floor. What trauma, knowing what was coming for him. How dark was Gabbatha, Pilate's judgment seat. There were no cries for mercy for the Lord at that time. There was just cries for his blood to be spilt. And how dark was Golgotha, the hill of the skull, having bore the sin and guilt of Adam's race as he's there and he's left to hang between heaven and earth, suspended there, and he's left to hang between the wrath of man and the wrath of God, and he's there, and at midday it says God turns off the light and he must hang in darkness. God showing and signifying that the one on the cross is cursed cursed for sin, cursed by God. This was he who said, I am the light of the world. This is the one that John says in chapter 1 verse 4, in him was life and that life was the light of men. And here he is hanging in darkness. Jesus knew what it was to sit in the darkest of dungeons, forsaken by God, forsaken And so I want to encourage you with this. The exhortation is, saint, if you're in darkness, Jesus has been there. He's been there. Look at him and marvel at him. And as you you look at and behold him, endure it. Marvel at what he says in verse 5 of our passage. The second half, he says, this great servant, I have not been rebellious and I have not drawn back in all of it. Oh, he depends on the Lord. Look, he trusts in the name of the Lord. He relies upon his God. This is he, in four times in our passage, in verse 4, in verse 5, in verse 7, in verse 9, he says, the sovereign Lord helps me. The sovereign Lord has given me. The sovereign Lord helps me. The sovereign Lord has opened my my ears. He trusts in the Lord. So this servant of the Lord... The exhortation is to learn from him, to imitate him, to keep your eyes upon him. Follow after him. He is the most faithful disciple. So this is the first group that God addresses, the faithful who find themselves in darkness. And he says to them, keep your eyes on the one that I'm promising will come. As you sit in darkness, trust and rely upon me. But now there's a second group. The second group that we're going to look at tonight, God addresses them. They're also Israelites. They're also in exile and they're also in darkness too. What's the difference then if they're experiencing all the same? What's the difference with this group? Look at verse 11. But now all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go walk in the light of your fires and of the blazing and of the torches you have set ablaze. Do you see that there? But now all of you, you see this second group, they see trouble. They're in distress. They know their guilt. They are without light as well. But how do they deal with the situation of, 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 of the consequences of their sin? How do they deal with it? He says here, you who light fires, who provide yourselves with torches. Do you see the first group? The first group are in darkness and they're called to to trust in the name of the Lord, to rely upon God. This second group is in darkness and what do they do? They don't trust in God and rely upon God. They make light for themselves. It's a picture here. The imagery is them creating hope. They don't trust in God because they have found something else to trust in. This is really the classic self-help remedy. They have sought the DIY instead of waiting upon the Lord. You see, he says here, you have lit fires, provided yourselves with torches. This is clear. This light and this fire, it's not from the Lord. It's of their own creating. This help is not from the Lord. It's their own. And really, this is great sin, 
great sin of Israel, great sin of men, this self-sufficiency, people seeking to live independently of God. This is the creature saying to the creator and sustainer, we are more than able. And this is men in in great darkness, in distress. They rally together and they sign a declaration of independence against God. What does does lighting fires and providing self with torches, what does that look like? What's that a picture of like practically? Well, let me give you two things here. There's many more, but let me give you two. Firstly, Lighting fires and providing yourself with a torch. This is dealing with difficulties and trial by relying upon yourself. Relying upon yourself. Many in Israel were prone to this. Now what's interesting here is the Hebrew says, it says you provide yourselves with, it literally means you gird yourselves with. This is to equip yourself, to to fill, to, to arm yourself, to be prepared, suited up as it were. This is really doing everything you can to make sure you get through the difficulty that is ahead. This is relying upon our own resources. Now, where, where, are, we seeing, where are we seeing this so clearly? Where are we see this clearly? Well, at the moment, the world hasn't experienced darkness like this present time for a long time. We are in worldwide calamity. What sorrow, what distress, what difficulty has come upon this world. We are experiencing darkness that is beyond our control. Death and trouble and suffering, economic crisis, all of these things that are beyond our control. And yet, what do we see from the nations? What do we see? We see men lighting fires, men providing themselves with torches, What's the motto when you, when you read and you, and you hear about what people are saying? What's the motto of the nations at the moment? If we, then there will be a brighter day ahead of us. If, if we, we will then get through this. We will rebuild and we will get back to our former glory. That, that's what's happening. And so what does it take the Lord to do to humble this proud world. We are doing exactly what Pharaoh did. God sent him plague after plague after plague. And what did he say in his heart? He would not yield, but in his heart he was saying, we can get through this. We can endure through this. We'll make it through. This is dark, but we will get through. And finally, God killed his son. Took the life of his firstborn. What, what does God have to do to humble this world, this proud world? Look at the situation that we're in. And yet, where are the humbled hearts and bended knees? Where are the Ninevites of today who fast and mourn over their sin and wait upon God because they see the threatenings of his judgment as Jonah prophesied against them? You don't see Ninevites today. All you see a torches being lit. Men feels the darkness, but they do not trust in God. They do not yield. And so I want to ask you, is, is that you? Are you in this? You, you, you've, you've seen this world. You've experienced darkness. You've experienced sorrow. You've experienced grief. You've experienced the consequences of your sin. You know what it is to have guilt. You know what it is to have a meaningless life. And yet... Have you found some kind of numbing medication to help you ride it out? You are just like them. What else does lighting fires and providing self with flaming torches look like? What else? Well, secondly, it is to walk in the light of your own righteousness. You see, self-sufficiency always, always leads to self-righteousness. Such people, they care not for the righteousness that comes from God that is to be received by faith. That is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They have no pleas for the cleansing blood of Jesus. They make no no petitions for heaven's provisions. None of that. Why? Their backpacks are so well stocked. They feel no need and they have no room for heaven's supply. Nothing. You see, what God has done, God's given us his rescue package. This is the incarnate son of God, Emmanuel, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
This is he, that, that the one that says that salvation, that he brings angels' desire to look into this so great a salvation that comes out of heaven and people pass him by. They pass him by as if he was just another product, another option for them. Why? Because their trolleys are already full. They can get through the darkness and they pass him by. And so Jesus comes onto the scene and he calls out and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And man responds and says, no thanks, we have enough light. This is to provide yourself with a torch. And so even in life, such people, and on, even on their deathbed, they would confidently enter into eternity with nothing more than their own candle. Their, their, their own righteousness is their torch and their fire, their, their good works, their church attendance, their upbringing, their good morals. And thus, they warm themselves by their own fire. And they comfort themselves in their own heat they generate. How is so loving and so gracious a God to respond to such rejection and such a response from the people? How is he to respond to them? Well, let us tremble at his terrible response. Look at verse 11. But now all of you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches. Sorry, but now all of you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. Do you see what he's saying? Look at that. Look at that first bit there. Go walk in the light. Literally in the Hebrew there. Go ahead. Go light them and go walk in the light that you generate. Go ahead. Isn't this an absolute awful pronouncement? Have you ever heard God speak words so terrible? This is the God who hates sin and whose anger burns against it. It is a God who delights in mercy, who calls sinners to his banquet. He is the God who runs after filthy prodigals and kisses them relentlessly. And now that same God gets to a point where he says, go ahead, go and live in your light. Go deny yourself no pleasure. Go live as you want. Go continue in your rebellion. Do church in your own light. Offer up your prayers do your serving go ahead and continue your filthy rags go trust in them these are awful awful words these are terrible words this to be abandoned by god and handed over that is hell on earth hell on earth and 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 i and and i bring these things up because from this passage my fear and I think should be every pastor's fear is that some who hear and sit in week after week the warnings of God, they go unheeded by you. As, as the threatenings of God are addressed and presented to you, you sit and you yawn as you warm yourself in your own fires. Sitting in your own light, you're content with a Christianity in your own light. You don't run to him because you have too much light. You don't throw yourself upon his mercy and depend upon him and believe in his son. But behold, that the response of God is far worse than just abandonment on earth. Second half of verse 11. It gets worse, these words, and there's nothing pleasant about this. God says, this is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. You see, those who resisted God's light who were burdened by his call, who rejected his holy provision, those who would rather guide themselves, those who would rather take the title upon themselves as deliverer, their own rescuers, God now says to them, this is what you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. You know, Jesus spoke so much, the servant of the Lord spoke so much about this this bed of torment that men will lie down on one day. He describes it like this. You will be cast out into utter darkness, outer darkness, where the worm does not die, where there will be incessant weeping, 
where there'll be so much regret and rage, there'll be gnashing of teeth. And this will be a place where another fire is lit, the lake of fire. For all those who are fire starters, they will be cast into the lake of fire. This is, this is devastating. This is a terrible thing. And oh, that God would give saving grace to everyone who hears, everyone who's listening, that you may never end up in this place. And oh, that God would give me special grace that I may never depart from his path and find myself in this place one day. This is, this is no game. You and I have family who are heading to this place. They have no desire for the light. They keep themselves warm. We have, ne- we have relatives and neighbors and colleagues, sons and daughters. What must we do? We must pray for them. We must pray. We must intercede. We must plead. We must share the gospel with them. Send them gospel sermons. Give them gospel go- books. This is, this is serious. And, and what about you? It may be you. You may be heading there. Even if you're a church member, even if you're a professing Christian, have you pulled yourself back from God? Have you withdrawn? Are you walking in the darkness of sin? Have you no affection for Jesus? Does he not consume your heart? He's his blood and righteousness, just theological concepts to you, but they, they have no deep value in your life. You do not treasure them. I want to counsel you, do not presume that you are one of his children and do not presume that you have a constant supply stream of grace coming from heaven into to your life. Don't do it. Now is the time. Don't, don't, don't swing into eternity on presumption, but rather repent. Quickly, quickly, quickly put out your fires, abandon your torches, and now set your eyes upon the morning star. Set your eyes upon the very lighthouse of God. It shines on Calvary. Turn your eyes upon him. It's Jesus the Son. It's Jesus who was crucified for sinners, who was raised from the dead, who is now seated on the throne of David. It is him that you must look to and turn to, to the one who says, if you believe in me, you'll never perish but have eternal life. It is he who says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows after me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, the light of life, forgiveness of sin eternal life with him come now come and take hold of him amen let me pray our father come before you and lord we call upon you we call upon you who truly are light Lord, we thank you for this great revelation of yourself. Thank you that you show yourself in this glorious way, that you are one that we can rely upon, that we can trust in. Forgive us, O oh God, for when we had lived in, in our own light, in our own warmth, when we have navigated our own way, when we had sought to control our own destiny. And God, we cast you aside. I pray for each person. I pray for each person who doesn't know you, who's sitting in darkness, who has no appetite for Christ. I pray you would turn their hearts. Let them see that their candle will be blown out one day. And may they believe in the Son and receive forgiveness and eternal life. And I pray for every Christian, those who are faithful, but at the moment are experiencing a time of darkness, trouble, sickness, ailments, whatever it may be. Lord, help them and remind them not to wait for feelings, but to look in your word to see what your name is and to draw strength and rely and to lean, to lean hard into the Lord and help them to keep their eyes fixed on the servant of the Lord who endured through the darkness, darkness that we will never have to taste. I pray this, O God, may you answer our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, church. I hope that the Lord has spoken to your hearts. Amen.